Payne soon began to climb the shoulder of the western hills, stopping along the way at frequent intervals to pick up more passengers from the several resorts and dude ranches in the Animas Valley. Then, on our way again. We made a longer stop at Rockwood to do some switching. Of course, there were more passengers to pick up too, since this is the last station accessible by highway. was done and the train headed out through a deep rock cut to enter the most spectacular part of the Animus Canyon. Cameras were really unlimbered as we swung out on a narrow ledge hundreds of feet above the sparkling emerald waters of the river far below. Here the roadbed was gouged and blasted from a sheer rock wall defying the barriers with which nature sought to protect her treasures. Construction of the railroad in 1881 opened up the fabulous gold and silver mines of the San Juan, many of which are consistent producers to this day. This scene in the Animus Gorge, accessible only by rail or afoot, has been a favorite with photographers since the noted William H. Jackson first recorded it on a 16 by 20 inch glass plate in the 1880s. As the train crept along the rock ledge, all eyes looked downward into the depths below. modern world did we seem to be. It was a surprise to come upon a power plant at the isolated little station of Tacoma, its generators turned by water surging down through a penstock from a lake in the heights above. A further surprise was to find the name Spike Buck on the tiny station building. Then I remembered a Hollywood movie company was on location nearby. Probably this was some of their doing. Sure enough, the conductor told me they were working just a few miles up the canyon, photographing a story of the early day history of the Denver and Rio Grande. Then we rounded a curve in the canyon, came upon their camp, set up to look like a construction camp of the 70s. On the newly built spur track, I was delighted to recognize an old friend, engine number 268, a veteran of 70 years service in the Colorado Rockies. I first saw the 268 about 10 years ago, pulling a coal train on the Baldwin branch. Next, in 1949, she was the hit of the Chicago Railroad Fair. I remembered how she looked there, pulling the popular sightseeing train, which handled more than 600,000 passengers that summer. And here she was again, looking just as frisky as ever. I had already arranged to stop off with the movie company for a couple of days, so the Silverton went on without me. The Paramount people were rehearsing a construction scene when I arrived. Everyone was milling about in a very confusing fashion, but I soon found out it was very well organized confusion. Everyone knew exactly what he was supposed to do and did it. The huge Technicolor camera was mounted on a specially built lift truck called the Blue Goose so it could be quickly moved to any angle. The crew soon stopped for lunch, which was served buffet style right out in the open. 
spotted Zesu Pitts, one of the stars, in her 1870 costume, among those getting their plates filled with the plentiful and delicious food they dished out. Zesu exchanged a little banter with J. Carol Nash, whom you know as Luigi on the radio, and Edmund O'Brien, then wandered off in search of a nice, soft rock to sit on. O'Brien's pretty wife, Olga San Juan, a musical comedy, took him away for a quiet tater tate Starlet Laura Elliott took advantage of the break to discuss her scenes for the afternoon with Lyle Betgeard, while the hairdresser added a few finishing touches to her coiffure. Well, lunchtime was soon over and the crew went back to work. First, some more shots of Pioneer Railroad building. This time, the Technicolor camera was mounted right on the rail train. Each scene was carefully identified with a clapboard before shooting began. They don't shoot the scenes in order, so I had a little trouble figuring out just what was going on most of the time. But some of the crew explained that the story was about the troubles of the pioneers in building a railroad through the Rockies. And most of their troubles were caused, in the picture at least, by a bunch of very unpleasant characters hired by a rival railroad. It seems that both railroads wanted to build through the narrow royal gorge of the Arkansas River, where there was room for only one, so considerable unpleasantness developed. But don't worry, it all comes out all right. In case you haven't guessed, the Rio Grande finally wins out, as it actually did. After each scene, the lily boy holds his lily in front of the camera to give the lab a check on the trueness of colors. While the camera crew set up for the next shot, Director Byron Haskin talked things over with Dean Jagger, who plays the part of General William J. Palmer, builder of the Rio Grande. In this next shot, the scene is General Palmer's tent. He has just completed an important conference with Eddie O'Brien, his construction superintendent, who is carrying on a little private feud with Laura Elliott, the general secretary. Looks like she's really giving him a bad time. The director wanted to change an angle, so head cameraman Ray Renahan picked out the right spot for the boys to set up and they proceeded to shift the heavy equipment. Now, these scenes were supposed to be at night, so they used artificial lighting and some special filters for the camera to get the right effect. Of course, our leading lady had to be appropriately dressed too. Woo woo! Now, in this scene, it seems like the general had just gotten the news that the bad guys had been up to some more devilment. Naturally, he called his secretary to tell her all about it. The special effects man, out of sight of the camera, added a touch of realism by pumping smoke through the chimney. The still photographer kept grabbing publicity shots between scenes. The cameraman decided that a tree by the tent would improve the pictorial composition. Rearranging nature is no great trick for the grip department. Director Haskin next did a bit of acting himself to show Laura just what he wanted in the next scene. The camera crew got all set. And here's the way they did it. Uh-oh, what's this? Our heroine consorting with one of the villains? Say, this looks bad. Before they shot some close-ups of the same action, the makeup man helped Laura check her paint job. After all, a girl must look her best, even when she's just been wakened in the middle of the night. Now, here we go. Same action. My cameraman borrowed one of Paramount's filters for these scenes to show you just how the nighttime effect is achieved. Looks pretty good, doesn't it? I kept on shooting even after the scene was over and can't say that I blame him. The next sequence on the schedule starred little old Cinderella herself. They tied a couple of cars on her and started her off down the canyon. I went along with the movie crew on the work train. 
darned if they didn't set up right at my favorite spot in the Animus Gorge for some exciting action shots. It seems the bad guys had built a barricade on the track. I don't know why, just for devilment maybe. Anyway, our heroine, the 268 I mean, got stopped in time and the good guys piled off and cleared the track. Of course, in the movie you won't see the director's fancy parasol or the mics and reflectors and all the other paraphernalia they use. On the shooting schedule was a little scene involving Zaisu Pitts and Paul Fix. Zaisu played the part of the construction camp cook and consoled all the fellows when they had trouble with their girlfriends or lost their shirts playing poker. In this scene, it seems like Eddie O'Brien is very unhappy about the way Laura Elliott has been treating him. Zaisu gives him the old pep talk, tells him to forget the gal and concentrate on building a railroad. They all seem to be pretty discouraged about the situation. Cheer up, kids, it's only a movie. Director Haskin explained the next scene to his actors. Then they went into action. The telegraph operator had a red-hot wire for Eddie. More bad news, it looks like. It's got him worried. The boom mic follows him off in case he wishes to comment on the situation. Ah, there's our baby again. You know, she played two parts in this picture. Overnight, she got a new paint job and became the 116 of the Canyon City and San Juan Railway, the Santa Fe subsidiary that battled with the Rio Grande for the Royal Gorge. The fancy cowcatcher was replaced with a more utilitarian arrangement, and assistant director Dick McWhorter gave the job his official okay. The business that day started out with some close-ups of Eddie O'Brien riding on a construction train. The camera was set up on another train on a parallel track, and the scenes made while both trains were moving. The side track was short, so they could shoot only one brief scene at a time, and they backed the trains to the end of the track and started all over again. While all this was going on, prop men were preparing another car in the train for use in a later scene. Every minute saved in production time is worth $33 on a million dollar budget picture such as this one. Eddie went through his brief action once more. The Lily Boy stepped in and the final take was in the can. The makeup man had to dirty up Sterling Hayden's face a little bit for the next scene. Hayden is the chief villain in the picture. Seems he'd been wounded and was on a runaway car with a case of dynamite. The fuse was lit, of course, and it burned shorter and shorter and shorter. In fact, it burned so far down that I got a little nervous myself till they told me the dynamite sticks were just dummies. Never did get to see what finally happened because they'd shot the main part of the sequence the week before. Well, that's it. Let's knock off for lunch. They fed us lunch that day at Tacoma, which was near where they'd been working. Afterwards, the crew indulged in a little good-natured horseplay on the big green lawn around the power plant manager's home. They were great ones for playing tricks on unsuspecting bystanders or even on each other. A couple of the fellows claimed to have caught a real live sting bat. The plant manager allowed us how he'd been in these parts for 30 years and never had seen such a thing. The boys warned him not to get too close or he might get stung. Well, he just wouldn't listen and sure enough, he got stung. To ease the pain, one of the bit players put a little comic routine involving a banana. Then he himself became an unexpected victim of the paddle. Laura Elliott spent a quiet moment telling Eddie's fortune. 
The cards predicted lots of trouble with everything coming out all right in the end. Well, lunch hour was soon over. And the gang went back to work. That afternoon was spent in making some close-ups for the big climactic sequence, showing Eddie and his pals riding in the cab of the 268 and jumping off while in motion. Now these were to be cut in with some long shots of the same action, and it will all end up in the finished picture among the events leading up to the big collision. Next morning, the bad guys rode into the Durango yard for another important scene. And here's an interesting coincidence. I got a load of that engine in the background. That's Cinderella's sister, Emma. That's right, it's the Emma Sweeney, which starred in the picture Ticket to Tomahawk, a twin sister of the 268. Sterling Hayden and his principal henchman posed for some close-ups. Hey, wait a minute, I thought he'd been blown to bits. Oh, well, I guess they'll get it all straightened out in the finished picture. Now, the idea of this sequence is that the bad guys steal a Rio Grande train. You'll see why later. And here's the holdup. The engineer and fireman get a look at the business end of a couple of six guns and climb out of the cab. The assistant director is the busiest man in the crew as he lines up the next bit of action. Well, the bad guys took over the train, headed down the main line with the throttle wide open. They're up to no good, that's for sure. Next, it was back up the canyon again, traveling on a special work train with the engines and cars used in the picture, plus some modern coaches and a couple of sightseeing cars from the railroad fair, a combination the like of which has never been seen before or since. At the site picked for the picture's climactic scene, camera and grip crews went to work to get everything in readiness. Newspaper and picture magazine photographers on hand to record the big collision, filed away the time by snapping the stars in various poses. Five separate color camera crews were used for the big scene each protected from flying debris by stout wooden barricades. Director Haskin conferred with the Rear Grand President Wilson McCarthy, who was on hand with the other officials of the railroad to watch a demonstration of the Hollywood method of scrapping old equipment. Meanwhile, the grips continued the job of building the camera shelters, and the two little trains were carefully lined up at the exact spot chosen for the smash-up. While waiting for the advance preparations, producer Nat Holt presented a handsome gold watch to Rear Grand Assistant Division Superintendent Tom Cummins. Tom had acted as technical advisor during the entire picture, and now his efforts were being suitably rewarded in front of the top brass of Railroad and Picture Company. Everything was finally in readiness. Press cameras set up at a safe distance, the select handful of spectators well out of the range of flying boilerplate. The two trains had been backed away to a predetermined distance, then started upon signal with split-second precision throttles pulled wide open. The crews unloaded on the fly. According to the story plot, the train the bad guys had stolen was being sent head-on into one of General Palmer's trains. To ensure a spectacular collision, both engines had been liberally loaded with dynamite triggered to explode on impact. Chugging and churning, the two ancient engines rocked down the single track at full speed, heading for their last meet, while Technicolor cameras recorded one of the most exciting spectacles ever to be filmed. And there they go! I'm sorry, I, I promised Nat Holt I wouldn't take the edge off his picture by showing you the whole scene, but believe me, it's terrific. Now, if you're worried about our heroine, Cinderella, I'll let you in on a secret. She had a double for this scene. Railroad officials refused to let anything happen to the 268, so another old-timer, the 345, was the engine that actually crashed into the 319. And if you object to smashing up those two engines, as did famed rail fan Lucius Beebe, well, we'll put them back together again for you. Like that. Well, that 
aimed at my visit to the Paramount movie game. And now I can hardly wait to see the Denver and Rio Grande on the screen to see how they use the disconnected scenes I saw photographed. But we started out to take a trip to Silverton. The movie interlude was just an interesting little digression. The real thrill available to anyone during the summer season is the narrow gauge journey to yesterday. Through the upper Animus Canyon, the train continued on through one of Colorado's unspoiled wilderness gorges, hugging the banks of the rushing river of lost souls in the depths of the mighty chasm it has carved through solid rock. On to the historic and picturesque little city of Silverton, set in an open mountain park completely surrounded by towering giants of the Rockies, fitting destination of our journey to yesterday. In this magnificent setting, man and his works are completely dwarfed by the immensity of nature. The colorful Silverton is the last of the once numerous narrow gauge passenger trains in Colorado, an anachronism in this day and age. Its narrow track and diminutive equipment are in striking contrast to the modern Rio Grande, whose high speed standard gauge main lines link east and west through Colorado and Utah. Direct descendant of the puffing, chugging passenger trains of yesteryear are today's sleek stainless steel streamliners such as the Chicago to San Francisco, California Zephyr, whose Vista Dome cars are full-scale first cousins to the Silverton's Silver Vista car. Brightly painted in the same color scheme featured on the Silverton is the streamlined Prospector, overnight speedster between Denver and Salt Lake City, and the Royal Gorge which pioneer railroaders fought for a pathway to El Dorado, gives its name to another Vista Dome train of today. Today's Rio Grande Railroad, made possible by the indomitable will of the men who first conquered the Rockies, carries on in the pioneering spirit of its founder. Today, as for 80 years, the scenic line of the world, the spectacular main line through the Rockies.